Uh, as Linda said, I, um, I chair the Dustman Health Committee for an alliance of, um, of 18 community groups. I live in Newcastle. Uh, we've lived there a number of years now and feel very attached to Newcastle, uh, quite deeply. I've moved around a lot in my lifetime, but I've, I've come back to Newcastle um, a, a couple of times and I've now been there sort of four years, lived there a, a couple of times before. Um, it's a great place. Anybody who's visited Newcastle will know. It's a, it's a, it's a gorgeous place to live, a terrific uh, lifestyle. Um, great getaway from Sydney if you're that way inclined. And I also have a share in a rural property, not, not too far out of Newcastle, where we have coal seam gas uh, exploration lease. Linda mentioned last night that with 16% of the, the valley floor um, under open cut coal mining now, there's another 64% of the valley that has exploration leases over it uh, for coal. Um, and then, you know, more than that of the whole state of New South Wales under exploration leases for coal seam gas. And that, that includes... Uh, a farm that, that, I, that I have a share in and have a great attachment to. I, I want to speak about, um, about our work in this alliance. Uh, I'd like to name the organisations that are working together. There's actually a number of others, and we've just, um, just recently had the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, who I know many of you know, come on board, and, and some other organisations as well. Suffice to say, it's, it's quite a broad alliance of groups, and, and like any alliance in, in the community, um, we, we know that our strength lies in working um, on issues that, that, we, that we share a concern around and in ways that we can readily agree to. Um, and this alliance has worked very strongly around coal, uh, sorry, coal dust, and that, that community health impacts and so on, because that's what unites us. Uh, for the most part, we live in Newcastle, and, and if, you, you know, if you've spent any time there, you'll know you can wipe your hand on the outside of a house and you're, you're going to have a black hand. Um, sometimes if my, you know, I, my phone rings and I know I'm in for a long phone conversation, uh, I work from home quite often, I'll, I'll get a bucket of water and a sponge and while I'm on the telephone just walk around the house, um, inside and outside, and, and you know, just take the, the, the black coal dust off. Um, so that is a, a unifying theme. Within this alliance of groups, though, there are groups who are concerned about whose who's organising motivation, if you like, is, is more around climate change or biodiversity or the wetlands or uh, you, you know, any, any number of other issues. This is what we're working on. Um, this is a proposal for a fourth coal terminal. Newcastle is the world's largest coal exporting port currently. Um, it may be overtaken by some that are proposed in Queensland in the short term um, if those terminals go ahead. What this site shows you is as you come towards me, towards the north, um, this is on an island in the mouth of the Hunter Estuary. You, you come into an area that's, that's become hugely important ecologically. In fact, to the extent that the, the green area that you see is a Ramsar-listed wetland. It's internationally recognised. Uh, it's part of the, a very important part of an international flight path for migratory birds. They come from all over the world and, and they stop here, including in Deep Pond, which you can see in the foreground here. But you can also see the existing coal terminals. There are three, one on the southern side of the, of the Hunter, two on the, uh, on the northern side of the Hunter, um, and then there's the suburbs. Um, I, I live about 700 metres uh, south, um, but there are, um, in Newcastle, where Nick, Nick uh, and others have, have done the maths on this, um, 30,000 people living within 500 metres of coal train lines. If you add the number of people who are living within 500 metres or 1,000 metres, let's say, of these stockpiles, you, you're getting to certainly more than, more than 60,000 people. Um, so we leave cheek and jowl with, with coal. That's, that's a reality in Newcastle and, and has been, in fact, since the, the first white fellas walked uh, down the beach after having been shipwrecked, escaping from the colony here in Sydney and discovered seams of coal as they walked along the beaches. Newcastle has been known for coal and has been a, a, a place where coal mining and extraction has gone on. There's another view, an aerial view, just sort of showing you what we're dealing with and the proposed fourth coal terminal uh, is, is in this area up to the, up to the um, sort of western side. This, is, this has been turned around. Um, to put it into context, in 1984, um, 21 million tonnes of coal were being exported from Newcastle. In 1997, um, that had increased with, with a second coal terminal to 77 million tonnes. Since then, we've seen a dramatic an escalation in the volume of coal exported from Newcastle. And to, to link back to, I guess, Scott's presentation a moment ago, um, they, they, these are just bars on a graph. Each bar 
is telling you of country that's being despoiled, this, uh, of people who are being displaced, whole communities that are being displaced, and of, of people who are losing, losing their, their history, uh, Aboriginal people certainly, um, and, and non-Aboriginal people. And you, you may have heard of the expression solastalgia, the, 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 the trauma of a, of a loss of place, um, which is being experienced by people throughout the Hunter. Um, the, the red bar is showing where we would end up with T4. And if you compare that to the 1984 numbers, clearly this is a dramatic e escalation. This is a coal terminal that's, that's been on the planning department's uh, table of, uh, you know, schedule of projects to consider and approve um, since, um, since late 2011. So throughout the whole calendar year of 2012, community groups organised community groups, held public meetings, held rallies, you know, petitioned, uh, lobbied, did research and so on. And it was during that period of time, during 2012, that our Dust and Health Committee uh, came together. As I said, we're concerned around a number of environmental impacts, um, the loss, loss, of, um, <laughs> loss, of, loss of country, loss of lifestyle, loss of livelihood, uh, environmental impacts, uh, the wetlands and so forth, the CO2 emissions, which are just in, in, you know, vast, uh, difficult to comprehend um, and, and compelling for many of the people involved in our group. But as I said, we, we have focused very strongly on coal and community health, in part because it's a, you know, it's a motivating concern for many of us living in Newcastle. Um, I, I won't lecture you about, um, about particle pollution uh, concerns uh, beyond just showing a, a slide or two um, and pointing out, I guess, that this bottom bullet point, that, that PM10 levels in, in the Hunter Valley uh, in fact exceeded the national standard uh, for protecting community health 115 times, um, looking at the raw data for 2012. So 17 monitoring stations throughout the Hunter. Um, most of those stations recorded at least one, sometimes made dozens of, of, of levels, over 50 micrograms per cubic metre, which is the national standard. But it is not a level that protects community health. It's a pragmatic level at which, in fact, our health is being harmed considerably. Uh, and in parts of the Hunter where there isn't any monitoring, including in Newcastle, those suburbs closest to the coal stockpiles, those residential areas closest to the coal train lines, the coal corridor as we call it, where no monitoring occurs, uh, where, where much higher levels of particle pollution uh, are likely to be experienced and, and where um, disadvantage of multiple forms are likely to be being encountered. Um, we, we've also looked at census data and we've mapped out that, that in this coal corridor, which is the, the red band of just 500 metres each side of the coal train line in the urban parts of Newcastle, this is not extending up to the Hunter, uh, 25,000 children go to school each day and 30,000 people live. Um, and I, I guess as we, you know, the, the, the contemporary urban form might be that the people who are somewhat, you know, more mobile economically situate themselves and you know, live closer to transit corridors. That's not, that's not the case in Newcastle. I think it would be fair to say that the demographics um, are the opposite, that, that in fact it's, it's less likely to be um, affluent, um, mobile folks who, who are living along the corridor. And of course there are many institutions along the coal corridor, because it's also a passenger rail network. Uh, it's the same train lines. I, um, I sometimes leave my telephone, my mobile telephone on audio, on, on, you know, with the volume on um, as I sleep at night time, and I get a bing, 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 um, waking me up and I get a smack in the head, what are you doing, turn that off. Um, it's it's um, uncomfortable because it wakes me up at night time. Um, it's much more uncomfortable for the people who are living in the areas where the alerts are being registered. Um, I received 25 of these alerts telling me that air pollution levels in the Hunter had exceeded the national standards for PM10, PM2.5 and TSP during April. Um, that wasn't an extraordinary month. I have received more than that in other months. Um, we, uh, we, we sort of we felt that we needed to understand the community, our own community. The 18 groups involved in the Alliance um, turned out volunteers on a wet Sunday morning in uh, July last year to door knock. Um, we door knocked 530 households around Newcastle in lots of areas, not only 
in the coal corridor where many of us live. Um, and th this graph shows you the number of times people spontaneously identify concerns associated with the proposed fourth, fourth coal terminal. Um, and, and you can see that if you combine dust, health, pollution, let's say, clearly the, the leading concern is, is, is that, and, and for good reason. Um, the perception, and, and I'm really hoping Wayne might pick up on this a little, um, speaking next, the, the, you, you know, there's the reality and there's the perception. And I think in both cases in Newcastle, um, we, we have every reason to be concerned about air pollution, um, and we are. So lots of different reasons to be concerned around T4. Um, I've, I've, I've spoken of already. I, I'm not going to sit there. The reality is that the New South Wales government is, um, I believe, set to approve this project. Yesterday, um, as I was coming down to Newcastle, or sorry, from Newcastle, um, I had news um, that PWCS, the Port Waratah Coal Services Company that's proposing T4, says that the, the mining, uh, the volume of coal being sent to the port by the miners in the Hunter Valley, the dozens of coal mines in the Hunter Valley, um, has been down during the last 12 months. In fact, we only export only, as the world's number one coal port, only exported 113 million tonnes of coal in the 2012 calendar year much less than the capacity of the current terminals. And for that reason, the company says that they don't need to build this terminal. They don't intend to build this terminal for up to five years. But they want approval now. Uh, so you can imagine that the phone calls that I've been part of, the text messages, the Facebooks, the emails, all of that, the flurry of um, ongoing... Um, ongoing anxiety, ongoing stress, ongoing trauma in the community that I live in, that even though we don't need this terminal, even though the companies don't need this terminal, um, we are nonetheless um, facing, facing that reality. And sorry, I, I will finish on this slide. We, uh, we fundraised last year um, $8,000, um, which was a bit of a record for any of our little groups, um, and we hired three sets of equipment to do monitoring in places where the company and the EPA don't do monitoring. That is, those places most likely to be experiencing pollution. The postcode lottery, um, you know, where we live. Um, we monitored in our houses, in our backyards, um, on our front porches. And these are the numbers, and I'll, I'll just leave them with you. The column in the middle is the column to look at. These are our addresses. Um, any number over 50 is a number over the national standard for PM10. These, these are the numbers that we recorded. The Tyres Hill, uh, where are we? Tyres Hill, Henry Street, 67.3 Carrington, Garrett Street. These are, these are, these are our friends' houses. This is, this is where people involved with our group live. These are the levels that their houses. The EPA doesn't monitor there. The risk assessment approaches don't assess what's going on there. The company doesn't want to know. The community did this monitoring. We did this monitoring, we did the fundraising for it, um, and we yesterday had a meeting in the health minister's office after having three times been denied a meeting with the health minister. The minister herself was not there. Uh, I'll leave you with that.